morning, everybody. Um, I'm Martin Evans. Uh, I'm the creative director at UNI. Uh, welcome to Brighton. For those of you who are um, online over there and not in the room, I'm sorry, uh, because this, what a lovely day and what a lovely place to start the day here on the top floor of our building with a beautiful view of sunny Brighton and the sea. Um, so I'm the creative director at UNI. So this event here in Brighton this morning is the first one that we've done in person since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, you and I think is a series of thought-provoking lectures designed to challenge perceptions and drive debate in our industry. Um, boy, if we got a good one for you here today. Um, we're joined by an audience live online. Everybody is super welcome. Um, when Joe's finished speaking to us, we'll spend some time having a chat, the two of us, um, and answering some of your questions. And our aim is to have you all out of here by 10. So we at you and I are the developers here at Circa Street. Uh, I'm very proud to welcome you here today for the first part of what is a big day of celebration for us, uh, the completion of this lovely scheme, nearly the completion of this lovely scheme. Uh, at lunchtime, we're going to have an official opening with the leader of Brighton and Hove City Council, Councillor McCafferty, and representatives of all of our partners who've helped us to deliver this project. And then this evening, we'll be having a proper celebration up here. There might even be a bit of disco dancing, imagine. Um, as property developers, we are essentially project managers, um, sitting at the center of a swirling mass of professionals from every discipline imaginable. We're conductors of an orchestra, if you like, um, an orchestra of many talents. Um, one of the great pleasures of that job is to revel in the expertise of those that you gather around you. A number of those people are in the room with us this morning, great architects, those who make an art of painting with numbers, um, and any number of other specialist skills, all of them honed with years and years of experience. And Joe Gibbons, here on my right, is one such expert. Um, I don't exaggerate, honestly, when I say that to enter into a discussion with Jo uh, about her work is to take a masterclass with a great teacher. Um, we met for the first time when she arrived in our office as a member of the team we worked out this morning in 2013. Um, led by the architect Shad KM to pitch in a competition for this job. Um, she brought me a purple sage plant, a salva officinalis. Um, this I know because Joe was very careful to explain to me everything I needed to know in order to care for it properly. And I did for a very long time until I'm afraid it died. But I did care for it for a long time. I think I put it in the wrong place. But anyway. Uh, if you ever imagined that a landscape architect was someone who filled in the bits between the buildings, then listen to Joe talk about how great landscape design can transform a place, deliver biodiversity net gain, save energy, provide health benefits, and contribute to a city's ability to clean its own air would quickly disabuse you of that notion. Joe's practice, Jane L. Gibbons, is one of the most respected in our business, as well as beautifully designed and planted landscapes in Avenue Road Park in North London, St Albans Cathedral, Walpole Park in Ealing, and the truly wonderful Dalston Curve Garden in, each, in East London. Joe's academic practice has produced many scholarly and inspiring research projects. To work with Joe is to understand the meaning of the word integrity. She is incredibly brave in her advocacy for her knowledge, in hugely inspiring in its application, and just simply a joy to spend time with. So when we decided to plan a think event to coincide with COP26, I couldn't think of anyone better to talk about the only subject that really matters in our world than Joe. So please, will you welcome the peerless Joe Gibbons. Well, thank you. Thank you for that really generous introduction. And um, as Martin said, it's great to be live. Um, too much time spent online. Um, and we purposefully called this um, talk Dirt just to attract attention. Um, and so I hope you will run with me for half an hour on a little journey. Um, because when I saw this picture, aged eight, at school, um, which was from the, it's called the Earth Rise, and it spearheaded the environmental movement, it took my breath away. And as it did the astronauts that weren't expecting to see it. Um, and it represents the most beautiful biosphere a web of interconnected, self-regenerative entities that we call ecosystems. And 60 years ago, this was the catalyst for the environmental movement, and today has inspired a very exciting new discipline um, called planetary health. And this new discipline 
is a solutions orientated transdisciplinary field and social movement. Um, and it is a response to the climate, biodiversity, and health crises which are interlinked. A balance can only be found in, with an ecocentric approach. We, ha we just can't think of this pyramidal approach anymore. We have to understand that we all occupy one planet. And our global environment is changing, not a little, but a lot. So a little bit about my background um, is that I'm a landscape architect, as Martin said. Quite a lot of people have no idea what that means. So I hope through this talk, you'll have a little bit more information about that. But my stable, if you like, is Design with Nature. Um, this book was written in 1969 by Ian McCarg, who was the professor of my professor, David Skinner. And Lewis Mumford described this seminal book as a vision for organic exuberance and human delight which ecology and ecological design promises to open up. So it's with some urgency that we find, you know, some 50 years later, you know, we haven't really grasped this. And so it was wonderful when this report came out, um, this review, which was sponsored by the government and written by Professor Desgupta Cambridge University, some 50 years later, which talks about how we're still trying to value nature. And it clearly describes the economics of biodiversity um, as a study in portfolio management with nature as the asset. So in this respect, this is our modus operandi. It has been our practice celebrated this year, our 35th anniversary. We've been through recessions. We've formed tremendous alliances and collaborations with Martin and, and lots of other clients. And, and our portfolio is varied, and I think that's really important. It's really important to be working at the micro with individuals and communities, as well as strategic planning, because all of this is about that connectivity between micro actions and, and global impacts. So just as a snapshot, on the, on the left is a retrofit with AHMM, um, and, and, it's, it, and it proposes urban forestry. As we hit 2008, an economic slide that building was put out to let and was fully let. Now, I'm not saying it's because there were beautiful trees and the windows could open. No study has been done to prove that, but it certainly contributed. We do HLF-funded historic park restoration, as Martin mentioned, Walpole Park in Ealing. We also do, for Stanhope, um, green infrastructure, if you like, which is all the green bits, in advance of development. So this is Ruskin Square that we set in. All the lots on either side are empty, but they're going to be built because there's, there's hope and there's trust that East Croydon can be a lovely place. And then on the right, it's habitat creation, urban habitat creation through community empowerment. And then on the other side, our cultural activities at the moment are with three museums, the Munk Museum has just opened up, and we've done a tiny little 2.280 square meters of meadow in front of this vast masculine building. We're working with Tracy Emin, and she will next, next year bring in the most extraordinary sculpture called the Mother, and that Mother will sit in this soft, soft meadow, flowering, dynamic, all about the soils, and she'll face out to sea vulnerable and yet strong and it's going to be a magnificent moment so everyone get to Oslo in spring next year. We're also doing the Museum of London which actually encapsulates a cultural layer cake, you know, a strap line of we are London. It, it brings together environment and, and cultural activity into one place and then on the right hand side is the ultimate interpretation that we're involved in and leading of deep time. That's 340 million years um, with the Natural History Museum um, in their five-acre garden around the museum. 
And, but we don't like to just do that kind of commission work. Every single project, we bring um, a sense of, whether we're commissioned or not formally, um, of research. And we call this action research, or rapid prototyping, if you like, where we're constantly seeking new ways of procurement, new ways of designing, new ways of collaborating, in order that that informs both our client and ourselves, the contractors we work with and the people who live in the landscapes that w and look after them that we create. And there's three areas that are particularly my passion. The first is urban forestry, because let's face it, without trees in cities, it, they w cities would not be a place we'd want to live. Um, and second is sustainable urban drainage, um, which sounds awfully dull, but it's incredibly important. It brings the joy of daylighting the water system, the water and the management train, if you want to talk about it in technical terms, to the surface rather than sticking it in a pipe so that biodiversity, well-being, we can all understand this very, very important function of the planet. And thirdly, which I want to talk about today, is soil biodiversity. And that's our soil scientist, Tim, Tim O'Hare, in a trench that we've created um, at, NEP, at the NEP rewilding project to investigate if you leave the soils alone after many, many decades of intensive agriculture, how quickly do they repair themselves? So let me take you into my world. And this is such a beautiful place. And um, this is an irreplaceable habitat. It's um, a place where you pause. It's a place where you fill yourself, fill your lungs with the most extraordinary smells of what is the life cycle, it's, it's the, the gentle decay of leaf litter and the gentle growth of this uh, in, incredible structure that we call the forest. And the soils um, that underlay and that are the foundation for these ecosystems are so undervalued and overlooked. And yet soil is critical infrastructure. To an engineer, infrastructure means roads, bridges and rails. To me, infrastructure means forest and soil. And it is the most incredible carbon sponge. It's probably one of the best kept secrets. It's multifunctional. If it's healthy, it will contain and attenuate water. We know that because that water is then taken up by the trees, by the vegetation, and it's alive. And you know, we call it black gold, but from a child, I've always been fascinated in the magic that is food waste into this beautiful, black, rich substance that smells so sweet, which we call compost. And we have Tom here. Where's Tom? Tom's in the room. And I think, you know, what's so amazing is Tom's network here in Brighton is about creating this gateway, this little door to this enormous world of soil biodiversity, which is, the f is, is so critical to um, survival. And, um, and we'll, we'll talk to Tom later about his wonderful work here in Brighton. So there seems to be a fundamental, to me, disconnect with soil. And, and yet, on the other hand, um, we all know as gardeners, that a healthy soil makes us incredibly happy. And that's not just kind of a feeling. That's known. The, the, the microbial life in soils will actually um, enhance our, our, our well-being. And compost um, is pure magic, and it's, uh, it, it sort of offers the ultimate feel-good factor. And this is a clandestine world, if you like, super soils and ecosystem services working away quietly, not asking for any money, not asking us any questions, just working away. All that leaf litter on the bottom um, lying on the ground isn't swept up by the cleansing department. It's taken down into the soil to replenish the top layer. And out of that soil comes hidden treasures like this purple toothwort, which um, grows as a parasite on, on roots of trees and in the springtime pops up above the soil um, and 
it's a kind of little tiny signal of lots and lots of activity below the surface, the major one being the mycelium network, which is an extraordinary wood-wide web of transmission, communications, and life support. And soils are so varied, you can't just talk about them in a singular way. And I think that's what's beautiful, um, is that we become more plural in our outlook. And we enjoy that. We enjoy the complexities. We enjoy working with each other across disciplines. This is a beautiful piece, um, uh, reproduction, um, out of a book that we've got uh, as a survey taken in 1935 of all American soils over the, the, over the USA, and then represented by an artist who was um, uh, uh, Mary, uh, Mary Arnold in this beautiful way so you can identify the kind of soils that were in your region. And that isn't just then what's below the ground. That then gives you your landscape character. It gives you the kind of characteristics of that landscape that you can then make decisions about other land use issues. And this is a, an installation that we made when we were asked to contribute to um, an, an exhibition on um, future cities. Um, and it was really to encapsulate in these large blown test tubes the beauty, the sensual beauty of the below ground, which have various narratives of natural process and human endeavor in layers, in horizons, which are far from dull. So we are on the cusp of an agricultural revolution, and we are, and the, that's a royal we, I guess, the Sustainable Soils Alliance and all of us who support that, lobbying to create statutory protection for the soil. If you can believe it, we don't have that. And so we have perhaps 40 harvests left in our soils, after which do we become an Easter Island. Um, but those healthy soils, if, we're met, if we come to our senses quick enough, um, that gives us high soil carbon. It gives us the ability to hold carbon in the soil and to be the most extraordinary um, climate solution. And the Environment Bill, which is staggering through its process at the moment and going back from the Lords to the House of Commons, they're fighting over this protection. So the Lords have said, we want to protect the soil. The House of Parliament, the House of Parliament has just said, no, nope, um, you know, we, we don't want to take that on. That's too radical. Um, but we must. We must do that. And all these reports, they're no good unless they connect up, unless they connect up to the MPPF, the National Planning um, Framework. Soils were not designed for intensive farming, and we've become disconnected. Soil loss and soil degradation is widespread. And, and brilliant journalists like George Monbiot has been talking about this for many, many years. Soil health, and this is um, Richard Upton's meadow that we created for him, um, is both about a physical, chemical, and biological health. It's about rebuilding organic matter in the soil through regenerative practice. To have the soil, to, to create a soil carbon sponge, if you like, that supports the, the water cycle, restoring hydrological processes, processes and mitigating both flood and drought. It's an approach to land management, and, but more than that, it's a way of life. It's a whole systems thinking. Um, it's about long-term stewardship that, in the planning sense, we call green infrastructure. Um, and, that, and that green infrastructure incorporates water resource, water resource management, ecological design, and sustainable architecture, without forgetting or, or dismissing the significance of the small, the significance of the everyday that we come to just take for granted. And on the other, at, at the other scale, we've got these SDGs. You know, and they're not just a bunch of graphics. They actually are meaningful. But somehow we've got to engage communities, engage ourselves in what this actually means. We have to change our ways. And we have to work across the disciplines. And we have to work outside our comfort zone. 
And if we're not working outside our comfort zone, then we're probably not working hard enough. So it's rooted from those goals in community and individual action. And so we can start at home. We can start by composting. We can start to depave and make right the wrongs of the past, to create porous, to create this sponginess which offers then the opportunity for, for replenishing and repairing. We can, we can invest in a soil management strategy. So rather than talking about muck away, away where and what muck? All soils are precious whether they're anthropogenic or whether they're a natural, um, a natural soil from a forest. It's the vocabulary we have to change around this, in my view. And certainly if the, um, if the weather was um, uh, forecasted in different ways with different words, then we would have a different attitude about weather and about the natural environment. And thirdly, um, we need to protect soils and we need to hold them open. It's the most simple act of holding open. Holding open for nature to allow the possibility. I love the picture on the right. I took it the other day. A little bit of leaf litter in um, beside a curb, and there you have a small maple that has self-seeded. On the other hand, you have great Victorian actions of, of forestry. Um, so those plain trees were probably planted 120 years ago. So collaborative community action of growing, nurturing, and protecting. The human condition is not just about health in a narrow biomedical way. It's about hope, fulfillment, and well-being. And it depends on healthy natural systems. And recognizing the intrinsic value of nature, starting with the soil, capturing the soil carbon economy. And there's no time to lose. We need to be grounded in realities, working in an interdisciplinary way to tackle the big questions and complexities with a willingness to cross boundaries. And so it's a very exciting moment. And it's a about being brave, taking care, taking responsibility if we care about a common future. Thank you. Right, we're going to um, uh, just move the lectern out of the way, <clears throat> then we're going to have a quick chat for uh, 20 minutes or half an hour. Okay, go. Which one are you? Like Tess and Claudia on Strictly, which one are you? Oh, Claudia. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, thank you. That was amazing. Um, uh, next week, when um, this is done, we'll be sending out a, new a newsletter, uh, which has uh, five or six articles in it that include uh, a piece written by Joe and five or six other people who Joe's commissioned to write pieces around this subject. One of them is an interview. And one of the questions that Joe asked uh, the lady who wrote the piece uh, was, what makes your heart sing? So I'm going to start by asking you that. What makes your heart sing, Jo? Um, lots of things. Um, but I think being asked to participate early in the... Oh, yeah. Okay, let's try and do the mic. Yeah, use your mic. There we go. Um, yeah, plenty of things. I'm an optimistic person, um, despite everything. And... Um, so what makes my heart sing professionally is being asked to join the party really early. It's, it's to be part of the very essence of the, um, if you like, the moment of, of uh, the idea of whatever the, the project is, is coming about in order to be able to help fashion the, the maximum potential. And then I guess in, in um, my everyday life, it's actually, um, this sounds a bit sad, but it's, it's kind of understanding and seeing the beauty of what lies beneath my feet. And that's not just the squeegeeness of the soil 
um, and that feeling of nature very, very close at hand. But it's also the smell, it's also the scent. And there is this amazing compound called Josmine, which is released when rains first hit dry soil. And it's something that as human being we're really attuned to, um, like four parts per trillion or something like that. And that, that smell, which really makes your brain buzz with joy, is that, I think that's what brings a smile to my face. Great. Um, most of our audience here in the room and uh, online this morning are professionals from our in wider industry. <clears throat> and part of the reason for us doing these events is to raise issues that are not talked about enough every day in the myriad of seminars and webinars that we get invited to. If there was one thing that you wanted to say to a captive audience this morning of people involved in development that they should be doing back to their desks this morning, what would you ask those people to do? Um, I think I would ask practical, a practical a action. practical thing to look at what your your look at your portfolio in a new light, um, and to employ a a soil scientist and a landscape architect and an ecologist on everything you do, and and to work with resource management in a new way that really will um, benefit all the way down the line from the economics and the, uh, to the procurement to the way in which everyone feels about the project in the long term. So I think it's to bring what most people think is the last thing to think about right to the front and to enjoy that process of understanding how we can build the natural systems um, and repair the natural systems into every project right from the start. Good, thank you. Um, there are two ways in which you can ask a question. If you're in the room here, you can just put your hand up. There are roving mics um, coming around the room. And if you would then just say who you are and where you're from and ask your question. If you're watching online, you can use the function on uh, the web page to uh, write your question. And I've got them right here so I can interact with you. Um, so, uh, Tom, uh, I'm going to ask you to ask your first question. Will you say who, who you are and uh, why you're here this morning and uh, ask your question of Joe? Thanks. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, hi. Um, I, um, my name's Tom. I, uh, I've been very passionate about soil through getting into sort of uh, agroforestry, agroecology, um, and um, we were part of the... Um, the, the field project by you and I, where we did a, um, a, a drink forest garden. And um, I was sort of transformed through that. Uh, we invested in a, a really good composter for our, our brewery and tried to make this garden grow. And we only had, you know, a couple of years. Um, and what, what transformed it more than anything was this really micro rich, bio, bio rich compost that we made in the tumbler. It was, you know, after it was steaming, we left it for a, a couple of months. It was a short time. And, didn't look like perfect compost, but I never forget the effect it had on the hops that we grew, which had just been really struggling to sort of climb at all. And then before you knew it, they were sort of reaching for the for the sky so fast. Um, and it, that that whole process ended up when lockdown happened. We noticed lots of people were getting um, sold very bad compost, but they wanted to grow raised beds. Um, so we started a compost club, and. Uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of grown, and I've been studying the soil food web with Dr. Elaine Ingham, and she, you know, she's always just brilliant at you know, really showing people the universe of life that is in compost. When you look at it under a microscope, it's like a sort of micro city of all of these creatures sort of working, um, well, eating each other. But <laughs> um, that's how nutrients really get made available to plants. And yeah, it's, Joe, I, I wanted to ask, um, could you share a bit more about the carbon um, uh, you know, the title, the subtitle of this talk was, um, yeah, how um, the soil can literally eat our carbon emissions. Um, and that's something I'm really passionate about. I think that the solution to climate change really does lie in the soil, you know, partly because soil organic matter is 50% carbon, which is not getting oxidized to CO2, but um, also because that Require, um, enables so much more water to be stored, so much more photosynthesis to be t take place, so much more um, evaporation, which has a very cooling effect on the earth with all that extra plant life. Um, I'd love to, 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 to 
to, to know a bit more about that, if you could share mm. some on the carbon drawdown impact. Mm. Well, you've pretty much answered your own question right there. <laughs> um, yeah, the key is healthy soils, obviously, and organic matter. And repairing the, um, the health of the soils is critical because a healthy soil, as you say, will mean that the hydrological cycles of attenuation and um, you know, the, the amount of air and so on and carbon that, it, that those soils can actually sequester are um, maximized. So I think what, what is hard for, what is probably the best kept secret is, you know, it's, it's second to the oceans in terms of its potential for carbon storage. Um, because of its ability to draw down and contain and attenuate and, and all those micro activities that you're talking about, which is uh, to do with its, the life cycles that are contained within it. So I think in all the sort of discussion about carbon emissions and so on, that's all really important, but this um, idea of uh, soils, of meadows and woodlands all being um, important carbon sinks is a, a critical discussion to get to get out there. Um, so it is to do with those um, natural processes that are held naturally in the soil that um, can't operate if they're not open and if they're not healthy. So it is about the organic um, matter that's in that soil. And that's where the composting is so critical. And, and where your, I think, where your activities in terms of making um, accessible um, to um, communities, a kind of little window onto a very big and complex world is so valuable. Who else? Matt Baxter. Oh, hang on. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> Guy in the third row. Sorry. Next. Um, I'm Mike Parkinson from Foreman Roberts. We're uh, part of the engineering team on working for you and I on, on Circus Street. Um, obviously climate is, is very in the news at the moment, um, but the, the question is really to you, as Martin, as much as to Joe. Um, the construction industry is predicated on, on growth. Growth means um, generally taking up green spaces, uh, and the development and, and the loss of green spaces through the construction industry is quite rapid at the moment. And somehow that uh, mental balance, that, that physical balance, has to change. How do, you, how do you see that coming about within an industry which is, which is focused on new building rather than giving back? Well, I, I can start on that. If you take Circus Street, it was one big hard slab. So we, this is actually about repair. This has opened up more soil than was there since the marketplace was built in the 1930s, I think. And before that, it was um, Wittens, I think they're called in Brighton. Twittens, that's it, Twitter and the Twittens. Um, um, so for many, many years, the, the, um, this site has been uh, built over. And so... The optimistic thing is that this has been about um, recognizing the historic agricultural patterns of Brighton going back hundreds of years, and then trying to look at a way of, of developing in a, w in a way that opens up um, pockets of soil that allow for these interconnected gardens and this reconnection with the soil. So, um, I think there's an important point in to do with um, reappropriating brownfield in a way that actually can restore and it can create opportunities. I think it's about development briefs which look, which value open space and do look at viability, does look at viability in a way um, where the open space, the value of it is properly accounted for in order that that moderates the quantum of development. So I think that is very important. Where existing, when, when the first move of, of looking at, at site potential, the existing assets, whether that's 
trees or soil or, or a combination of both are properly valued and integrated into, in, into the process. So I think there's, it's a very good question and I think it is about a new way of looking <coughs> at um, urban environments and doing better with, with, the existing, um, with the existing environment at quite a lot of places and trying not to do too much beyond that. There is plenty of opportunity within our existing urban centres, I think. Uh, I think we have to start from the perspective that I think fueled your question, which is that inherently all development it causes some harm. And so our, our, our business is to make it cause as little as possible because we can't do without it. People need somewhere to live and work and buy their food. Um, so it's our job to minimise our impact in development. And it's really as simple as that. That's not an easy thing to do, but it's a simple concept. The concept of biodiversity net gain is also really simple. It's about saying when you've finished your development, you should have more biodiversity in the place where you build than it was when it started. And that's illustrated by Joe's point about this place. A great big concrete slab covered this entire site. Now, not so, m not so much. Um, it's also about, as Joe said too, valuing, understanding and celebrating the value of green space. So we are very lucky in our company in, uh, in Manchester. We're building a very large 25-acre scheme right in the centre of the city. And in the middle of that scheme is a clear six-acre public park. And it's the first thing that we're building. There's a river running through the centre of it, and around that river we're creating a park. And we are spending an, a lot of money building that park first before we've even put a single brick or concrete slab down to build a building. And we're doing that because we think it is the most important part of that scheme. Uh, a one and a half million square feet of offices, 2,000 homes, around a park. All of those things will be commercially more valuable, let alone all of the other benefits that it will bring to the city, simply because they sit around a six-acre public park with 145 trees that will be in there very shortly. So it, it, for us as developers, it's about doing the right thing, getting it right, understanding the uh, environmental imperative, but also not being afraid to hunt down how it makes us more successful commercially, because that's what drives us and our mm. shareholders. Mm. So if we, the sweet spot is when you can bring those two things mm. together, mm. when you can bring the environmental social impact together with the mm. viability impact of your Yeah, and project. I think also it's about being generous in your operations mm. and looking beyond boundaries. Um, and we have to have this attitude to what's what's called in the train up up trade up upstream thinking, which is about the impacts below or, or below you or above you in the system. And I think that's really important because there are a lot of opportunities in opening up green infrastructure connections that are to the wider benefit of of the broader community, not just the community that is being made. Um, and that, that needs a certain generosity of spirit, I think. And I think that's, it's, a, it's an approach which is about being generous and, uh, and about being collaborative. And that's within the build-up of the, of the development teams, but also with the wider community. Um, Matt, I'll come back to you in a sec, um, but I just uh, give uh, somebody online a chance. So uh, one question in from online. Uh, this is a big issue at the moment, particularly post-Grenfell with all of the issues about cladding and uh, external uh, elevations of buildings. What's your view on vertical landscaping on buildings? Yeah, I think there's a lot of greenwash going on, to be honest, and it really upsets me um, applied, um, applied systems. I think we do need to hold the soil open adjacent to buildings in a modest way quite often, in order to get roots in the ground into Mother Earth. Once you do that, the potential, given a good landscape architect and um, you know, good, good, good solutions, design solutions, can be um, quite spectacular. But I think this is where you know, technology, we, get, we fall in love with technology and systems and, and everything. And actually, it's okay to be simple. It's okay to work with nature and to be very, um, and, and to be straightforward about having the knowledge of what plants can do what. So I think vertical landscapes is really important. If you go around any city, you'll see at this time of year, a whole elevation clothed in Boston ivy turning red, and it's beautiful. That's doing it, it probably from a tiny little gap in the pavement. 
Um, and that's much more resilient and much more sustainable than having you know, a huge uh, system of plastic cells and plants that rely on automatic irrigation. So I think every facade, every aspect of the built environment has the potential to support plant growth and support wildlife in that. Um, it's just making it in a way that's sustainable. Matt, hang on, wait, you wait for the microphone. Thank you. So that the folks online can hear you. Thanks. Um, thanks for talking about your work, Joe. I thought it was fascinating, really interesting. Uh, I'm Matt Baxter. I'm co-founder and creative director of Baxter & Bailey. Uh, we're a creative agency based here in Brighton, uh, specialising in brand strategy and brand identity and working largely with clients who uh, are working to make a positive impact in the world. Uh, and be partly, I suppose, because of what we do uh, in our agency, I was struck by something you said about language. We occupy a lot of our time and thought uh, with language and effective communication. And you talked about changing the language and changing the terminology in order to bring people in. Um, and, it, and it strikes me that the language that we use in architecture, development, culture, art, is exclusive. It's, we use terminology that's exclusive to our industry because we think it's the right thing to do, but it excludes mm -hmm. audiences, the wider public, uh, and in terms of effective communication, in my view, that's a bad thing. So my, I suppose my question is, in a country where our political leaders subscribe to that exclusivity, they use not only complicated language, they use actual Latin in order to communicate their superiority, in inverted commas, what, how much of a battle do you think we have on our hands to police ourselves, if that's the right term, in terms of our use of language, our, our use of exclusive language, uh, and our use of uh, more open, descriptive language, talking about things, people, events, mm. in order to bring people in? Do you think we're on, on the way there? Do you think we have a, mm. a bit of a battle on our hands? I, I think, think, we, I think do? we do. I think it's a really good question, because... Um, you know, in some of the meetings I sit in, I think if someone dropped in here, they would literally not know what's being talked about. Everything's in acronyms. No one's being generous enough to just talk in plain English. And the English language is so beautiful. And you see Robert McFarlane's books on all the language, all the, all the vocabulary that's being lost, um, which describes landscapes, which describes feelings to do with whatever it is, weather or natural cycles. So I think it's a really important points great that you bring it up um, and that in a way is why we called it dirt because we just thought you know that there is this especially with soil when you say soil soiled muck dirt you know it's all derogatory and i think it's just as easy to think about positive descriptions um, which invite people to engage um, and i think it's a very powerful way of doing that and if you can be generous in the way that you explain things i mean i remember one time we were doing some engagement with some young young men in the pool of london and it was before more london was built and we were the developers uh, wanted us uh, to engage with with this big scheme and um, the viaduct there is very much a physical divide between the haves and the haves not and we were on the other side of the viaduct and I was talking to this young man who used to go to the boxing club there uh, about the potential and he said oh I get it yeah you're sticking things in and I went well not really well, that's not really our aim but you know that's his thing yeah you're going to stick things in no no we're going to grow things up with you and that process is going to be something that's going to involve you and this is why we're doing this so I think I think it's um I, I think we try our best to um, not just be, it's not about plain English, it's being about evocative and using the beauty of the English language to invite people to be part of the conversation. Joe, too, too often in our business, uh, what characterizes our business as developers and people who work around developers is that we design and create these places and then they're done and we move on. And so much of how uh, these places will survive and thrive into the future, like Circus Street here, 
is to work with the people who will live and work and come and visit here to maintain this place's ability to contribute to that sustainability and uh, agenda. Um, and I'm thinking about uh, systems that have been put into schemes to provide um, allotments or mm. uh, you know urban growing mm. spaces on roofs we have in our scheme in Deptford um, it here. Uh, is there any w uh, particularly successful scheme that you've been involved in or that mm. you've seen where ha and how that has worked to bring groups of people together who occupy a place and encourage them better to mm. um, understand and support them in terms of their ability to grow and use the land to mm. enrich their lives? Um, yes, I mean, there's lots of examples. I mean, I remember at the interview that we had with you, um, and we bought, as you say, the, the pineapple sage, but it was also in a bag by two brothers who were recycling, upcycling the um, HGV material, what's it called, the sort of canvas that goes around uh, uh, on the back of a lorry into, um, into a useful bag. And it was about... Um, getting the right tenants uh, uh, into a place to create the right sort of atmosphere and and the right sort of and, and to give the kind of clues of the suggestion of a community that could develop and I think this thing of stewardship and about taking responsibility taking care or caretaking or facilities management whatever you want to call it but the fact is it should be a broad school of involvement of community right from the very start all the way through a development because as has been pointed out the development process is a violent process sometimes and it's very um, difficult for people who are not um, able to understand plans and elevations and so on to really appreciate what's going on so the, the stewardship of a community, the stewardship of the place and the stewardship of the wider environment all come together. And in the best examples, you get that coming out the other end with a, um, a governance structure that allows for those groups of individuals who have been involved and, uh, and, and new communities to also get on board to go forward. Because when we've finished, so-called, it's just started. This place has just started for us, you know. I mean, we're talking about trees that are hopefully going to last for many, many decades, if not centuries. And so the opportunity for growing spaces is a wonderful pay, uh, sort of opportunity to invite people to actually physically get engaged in what it means to caretake, what it means to look after um, a place um, into the future and become involved and as soon as there's that moment of involvement it's really fantastic you get this sense of ownership that comes with that and then you get the sense of people who are going to protect that place so for instance one one project that we worked on and we still continue to offer our advice just as friends is at the Dalston Eastern Curve in Hackney and there, that was a backland site. We, it was actually, we found um, 40 years of illegal fly tipping. So underneath that garden of fridges, um, beds, mattresses, everything. Bodies. Um, yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so we, th but above it is a pioneer forest, a growing spaces with good soil, and, but it's people. People and soil, people and environment. We can't separate these things. Soil is about people, and that and the people who organise and who run that social community, uh, that social enterprise called Grow, Cook, Eat, are the gatekeepers. They are the people who open the door on the world of what it means to to partake in urban agriculture or allotment, uh, being uh, looking after an allotment, and to. Um, a community that may never have had that experience before, um, and that, and in terms of success, if you want to, you know, if you want to gauge success, then I would say success or excellence in anything we do can be measured in terms of how it sustains life, and if that life is the community and the microorganisms in the soil and the birds and the trees, then that's that's excellent. Um, so it, I think it's, um, 
I think this uh, involvement isn't just a nice fluffy thing of a nice to have is an essential quality of any of any uh, any proposal any development thank you hello is it on is it on yeah it is on hi i'm benji from commonplace we're a community and resident engagement platform that's used by a whole mixture of people local authorities and developers and housing associations i wanted to build a little bit about on what you were talking about there so we talked about implementing green spaces, implementing allotments or garden spaces. I, I, that's all very infrastructural and, and it is possible to kind of walk away and leave a few wardens or people who really care to kind of protect and manage that space. But I, I wonder what role housing, or housing associations have in creating greener, carbon friendlier behavior amongst their communities and to what extent you think the onus should be on them to continue that process after the build has finished. Mm. I, I think it's, I, I mean, Martin knows this because I've written papers on it um, from the moment that we did our One Planet Living um, exercise at the start of this project is that that is that the caretaking aspect is absolutely critical. Uh, it's critical in terms of um, providing a framework within which people who can be very transient, communities can be very transient, but for whatever that moment in time that those individuals are part of that community, that they have, that there is that structure there that is, um, and this is about generosity and it's about believing in the future and investing in the future. It's about creating a different kind of caretaking, I think, on these uh, d um, related to development where there's a long-term investment. Um, and if you look at any HLF-funded project, that's what's required. The HLF require, um, that's a heritage lottery fund, um, as it was, uh, it requires a minimum of 10 years of that kind of structure in place. And that is an absolute minimum. So I think engaging the right agencies um, to partner with, to show, to demonstrate that sense of long-term responsibility is an absolutely vital aspect of any development. Uh, front row. Oh. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed this. It's absolutely fantastic and a revelation. Can you say who you are? Yeah. yeah. My name is Paul Vick of Paul Vick Architects. Um, we're working on a number of projects, including with hards, blank, scape, smaller, larger. Um, and I'd be really interested to know some of the sort of challenges from your particular point of view. I mean, one particular, and I, I suppose it's a, a mix of three p questions per se. One is, what is enough green? Six acres sounds fantastic. When they did Central Park at New York, they were, you know, they were talking about just chopping off one block, but they refused, and there was a lot of activism about that, and they got the extra block. So what is enough, I suppose, is the question to you, especially since we're at a point where there's a lot of focus at the moment on this. Um, and also, uh, specifically, how do we do that where perhaps literally depths of soil are a, a, a massive issue for construction and in cities? Mm -hmm. And any other challenge? I mean, we, when we talk to the gardeners on you know, on the Hampstead Heath, for example, with the Corporation of London. You know, it's a very managed approach. Some of it's very ancient, some of it's new. The, the, the notion of sight lines to St. Paul's kick in on heights of trees. I mean, it, and it's an abundance of life, but the history of that life is changing. And I know that's quite nuanced in a way because your message is very clear and fantastic, but it'd be really interesting to hear some of those sorts of emerging challenges once we get into it. Mm. Thank you. Um, well, all landscapes are managed. Um, you know, we, we, we have this notion of wilderness on the planet, but there isn't any wilderness. Everything's affected by man, and everything is managed. So that has been a long-term... That, that, that is the way in which um, Hampstead Heath or, you know, um, Yellowstone Park or wherever, there's a management plan behind all of that. There's a series of decisions. Um, so we have to realize that with the, for instance, with the agricultural bill coming forward in this agric agricultural revolution, we need to have a vision. You know, it's no good just saying, 
oh, it's over to the farmers, and some farmers are amazing, and other farmers are struggling at the moment. But what is our vision for the landscape? We've actually set in aspic an, a, an ecological disaster in terms of the Lake Districts being a UNESCO protected site because the flooding downstream off those uh, denuded hills will continue and the aesthetic will not be able to be changed because <laughs> it's protected. So we do need to understand um, that, that we, it's the land, the soil is about people. Trees are about people. We have that potential to either disregard or to foster. Um, so that's just generally, you know, when you're looking around at your natural environment, it's a very interesting thing to consider that, you know, the Great Windsor Forest has a huge management plan behind it, and it has done for centuries. Um, so your question of what is enough, well, is the quality of what? It's no, it's no good just having a big desert and it just being big. The, the fact is that every single site is different. Every single um, proposition requires um, a different approach is with a different community. We never take a sort of a standard approach to anything. Um, so um, there is consistently different ways that are being evolved about how to calculate um, biodiversity net gain, and we're talking about this together. Um, and, but we have to get beyond the metrics. We have to um, provide some way of the planning officers being able to, I guess, easily um, see that there has been a minimum standard that has been created but we actually need to provide uh, quality um, and biodiversity um, into, our, into our developments. And that means um, being opportunistic and being inventive about the way in which we approach those places. Um, now, I think that in terms of the challenges, um, there are, they are considerable, and especially in the urban environment. But um, if you, we wrote a um, guidance, design guidance for Transport for London on sustainable urban drainage. Now, that was actually about well-being and biodiversity as much as it was about um, providing uh, good quality water and, and mitigating these extreme, extreme events. So um, it's... Uh, as one of the engineers said to me, Joe, you can't turn, you can't, you can't com completely change the culture of people who are embedded in a modus operandi all their lives. But what you can do is you can start to change the direction of the tanker. And so we need to all contribute to how we shift our perspective bit by bit. Um, and if you take... Um, many, many micro actions, then I do believe that can build into a really um, big impact. Great, we've got a couple of minutes left um, before we prompt it. Oh, blimey. <laughs> <laughs> a forest of hands, go. Okay. Uh, can, you ask a, can you ask a question that might have a slightly quick answer? Yes, Great, it will thank be, you. Actually. Uh, my name's Heidi. I'm the gardener for Circus Street. Hello. We've Welcome. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, I was really cross recently to realise that all the bulbs that I source are dipped in pesticides and we're selling them as pollinators. And when you were saying about it being knocked back from the House of Lords to the House of Commons, is there anything we can do to kind of push that forward and push, you know, certainly the amount of pesticides used within that are kept quiet yeah. and the amount that we need to move it forward? Well, the, the Soil Association came out of a 1940s um, experiment which was called the Peckham Experiment, which was about human health. And those physicians set up the Soil Association, understanding that direct relationship between health of the soil and health of humanity. So, I mean, I think one really good way of doing it is to support those organisations who are well embedded in lobbying. That is the Soil Association and also the Sustainable Soils Alliance. Um, and, you know, I may meet you in uh, 
Parliament Square <laughs> shortly. I'll be there. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I promised everybody that we would wrap up by 10, so I'm going to keep to my promise. Sorry. Um, I was going to say one, uh, one last thing, just to wrap up, uh, other than to thank Joe immensely for a fantastic opportunity to listen to somebody who's uh, at the top of their game uh, here in this enormously important subject this morning, um, is that the first time we met was in a room, meeting room in our office, uh, in London Bridge, when Joe came as part of a team to pitch, as I said in my introduction, to pitch to do this work. Now, that doesn't happen very often. That at that early stage of uh, presentation, an architect will bring uh, a, a landscape designer side by side together for a concerted team pitch, showing that the buildings and the surroundings and the landscaping are one, pro one project. It, it was one of the main reasons that they won the job because it was such a complete and beautiful scheme. So uh, that's going to be my uh, exhortation to you architects and developers. Architects bring a landscape designer with you right from the start. Developers demand a landscape designer right from the start. Those are my two. Uh, uh, and tips. listen to the landscape And listen architect. to them. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I'm just going to say, so th first, thank you all for coming. Uh, online people, thank you very much for coming. Joe. Amazing, thank yeah, you. Please thank you. show Joe your appreciation. Um, there is, over, like I can see, plenty of breakfast and coffee and tea over there, so you are very, very welcome to stay and talk, and uh, I'm sure Joe will be happy to uh, talk to any of you. Um, but anyway, uh, enjoy yourselves. <laughs>